and, and it's uh, welcome everyone thank you for for attending to this panel at the global online conference uh, empowering learners for the age of ai uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here uh, presenting our panelists uh, the, the title of the, of the panel is Improving Teaching and Learning in the Classroom with AI. I would allow me to show this screen where you, could, you can uh, see the, the panelist names. Uh, I'm Hector Ceballos. Uh, I'm director of the Living Lab and Data Hub uh, at the Institute for the Future of Education in Tecnológico de Monterrey, Mexico. And, and today we're going to, to have a excellent panelist uh, starting from with Genaro Zavala, who is interim director of the research lab of the Institute for the Future of Education at, at Tecno Monterrey. Kenneth Law, senior lecturer from the Singapore University of Technology and Design at Singapore. Roberto Martinez Maldonado, senior lecturer of the Depart Department of Human Centered Computing at Monash University, Australia. Also, uh, Luis Fernando Moran Mirabal, Living Lab Coordinator at the Institute for the Future of Education at Tech de Monterrey, Mexico as well. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, speak briefly about the purpose of the, of the panel. You read the description, but here we have it. Uh, the ever increasing use of disruptive technologies in education seeks to improve the way in which teachers and learners interact with within a classroom where it's a remote, hybrid, or in-person environment. The interaction we are, of we are not looking at the at the uh, slide, Hector. Slides. Okay, uh, it's okay. I can I can only keep this. Uh, uh, the introduction of innovative learning platforms to incorporate visual, augmented, and mixed reality, along with the use of multimodal devices that track visual, spoken, spatial, emotional, and neural attributes, has allowed researchers and faculty members to gain a deeper understanding of the interactions taking place in such environments. Furthermore, the development of scientific fields such as human computer interaction, computer vision, machine learning, Educational data mining, learning analytics, and model learning analytics has promoted the use of artificial intelligence techniques to translate data traces into pedagogical constructs, behavioral and environmental factors, learning indicators, and actionable feedback. These prominent fields of study aim to close the gap between technology and pedagogy in physical, digital, and cyberphysical learning environments. This panel aims at sharing multiple initiatives and projects taking place at the institution represented by our panelists, which are focused on improving the teaching and learning process through the use of AI. Uh, now I will ask our speakers to open this panel by introducing themselves and give us a general overview of the projects they are developing in this sense. We could start with uh, Genaro, Genaro Zavala. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Hector, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Genaro Zavala. I, I am the interim director of the research lab of the Institute for the Future of Education of Tecnológico Monterrey in Monterrey, Mexico. And I'm going to talk about um, some projects we are working on several, uh, on several of them that involve artificial intelligence. I will mention only three of them. Uh, we are working in iClassroom, it's an intelligent non-invasive monitoring system that analyzes in real time the student's level of engagement during a class. It generates a set of analytic of group and individual behavior. That means not only group, but also an individual behavior. It has three components. The sensor to deploy in the classroom to monitor the student's posts and gestures, a software based on artificial intelligence to analyze student behavior, and data visualization panel that shows uh, in a friendly interface, the result of the analysis of the engagement of the students. Uh, the information display on the visualization uh, has a purpose for instructors to make decisions in real time about how the activities are being developed and timely include, if necessary, meca 
metacognitive tools that stimulate a student's attention and engagement. Uh, this project, this, project uh, this is a project that Roberto Ponce, one of the, our, our professors, is leading. We have uh, the second project that we'd like to talk about is Adaptive Learning Platform to teach fundamental courses such as physics, mathematics, and computer science. We just finished the implementation of a pilot study with 600 students, half of them are the, the control group. The idea was to use the capabilities of adaptive learning for students to review that, what they individually need. Since our programs, uh, you may not know, but Tecnológico Monterrey uh, is a competent base, has a competent based education. So the project objective is not only to measure the impact of, of learning, but also in the development of student competences and determine the interaction between the teacher and the platform and the student and the platform. This is a project that Elvira Rincón of the IFE is, is leading. And then the third project that I would like to talk about is um, uh, we are using uh, Python that has a library of natural language processing algorithms, algorithms designed to analyze and evaluate written, uh, written texts by students. Uh, there are advances in, in determining the lexical corpus, that is mainly the richness of vocabulary, but also lexical, semantic, and synthetic richness in Spanish, of course, and the possible correlation with the level of cognitive comprehension argumentation capacity. So we are training the algorithms, algorithms to assess the development of critical variables, think, uh, critical thinking variables, such as metacognition, perspective, inference, and implications. And this is a project that Patricia Caratotolo, one of our professors in the research lab, is leading. So those are the three projects I, I wanted to tell you about. Thank you. Uh, we we'll continue with Kenneth. Uh, thank you, Hector. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, so I'm actually uh, at, from uh, Singapore, uh, from the University of Technology of Design, uh, where I'm also uh, the uh, director of the Office of Digital Learning. And under Digital Learning Office, we actually have this initiative, we call it uh, Campus X, whereby we do uh, certain trials, experiments on uh, cyber physical learning. And you know, for this, uh, under Campus X, definitely uh, you know, learning analytics, AI is uh, one part of what the trials. Uh, we also have trials in other areas like AR, VR, uh, metaverse learning, uh, robotics as well. And uh, the whole aim is to see how we can leverage technologies to uh, improve the uh, learning outcomes for students and also for us to teach better, uh, particularly focusing on uh, how we can, you know, introduce students, you know, um, into a classroom, remote students, you know, to interact effectively in the classroom as well as with uh, physical students who are face-to-face -face in the classroom as well. So um, I'll go into the project details later on, uh, but this is just a, a short introduction. Mm. Thank you, Hector. Mm. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, we continue with Roberto, Roberto Martinez. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to quickly um, bring uh, one of our projects in at Monash University. We have um, we are working with physical learning and augmenting physical sp spaces for learning with um, sensing capabilities. Um, this is one of the main scenarios where we are working. It's a specialized classroom, so the classical classroom where, where there is uh, a teacher lecturing. Um, but it's more as an immersive experience and it's specifically for the context of healthcare education. So as you can see, nurses can talk with each other, they need to solve like a puzzle and then um, they, they move as, as well in the space. And this is our, it was our initial vision it was to enhance this space with different sensors, with microphones, with inner positioning sensors and bracelets to measure certain um, physiological uh, indicators. Um, and the purpose was, is to uh, enhance the reflection that happens after these um, this scenarios. And you can see that this is a family of learning situations where um, it, it's commonly used uh, to simulate uh, high stakes situations. Like, so students can practice in a less risky environment, uh, for example, in healthcare and um, police training, uh, firefighting, et cetera. 
And we're starting to make these inroads into actually showing something back to teachers and students. This is lots of information we can capture. And the challenge is how to then simplify it in a way that is useful. Um, this is one of our prototypes. It was actually delivered in, a, in an actual class, uh, well, set of classes uh, this year. This is uh, information about the indoor positioning. In this case, only two students and the teacher was leading the reflective debrief after these, these highly effective teamwork tasks. Um, and this is combined also audio. So you see where people were talking and, and they start to, to spark some conversation about teamwork dynamics. Um, and uh, we got feedback about as well that, that nurses, nursing teachers want to know more about the content of the conversation, not only seeing dots in a map from the positioning sensors. So we start to also combine um, the rapidly evolving uh, AI uh, tools that, that uh, this year is just like going to a different level. And I think in following years, it's just like we're going to enable lots of new possibilities, but at the same time, it's potentially disrupting our society. And, and this is one example of how we can then uh, automatically get the transcript of these conversations, pair them with the positioning and, and use uh, in this case, the technique is epistemic network analysis to identify which groups and where in which position, um, what was the kind of conversation, team conversation that was happening. These are codes um, that are coming from teamwork theory. I'm not going to get too much into the details, but the idea is that we're trying to identify the kind of conversation that characterizes high um, effective teams versus the ones that, that didn't were not that effective that they didn't find what is the solution. And this can help to, to, to move research to the next level, but at the same time, um, other we can create um, user interfaces for, for teachers and students. So this is the example I just wanted to show. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, Luis Moran? Thanks, Hector. Uh, I am Luis Moran Mirabal. Uh, I am the Living Lab Coordinator uh, at the Living Lab and Data Hub Initiative uh, at the Institute for the Future of Education in Tecnológico de Monterrey. And I can share that the IFE Living Lab uh, was established in December 2021 to promote uh, educational innovation and experimental research at Tecnológico de Monterrey. And we achieve this uh, purpose in two ways. Uh, on one side, uh, we partner with EdTech companies to sponsor and launch technology-based research and development calls in which uh, multi-institution interdisciplinary teams submit proposals that aim to test and improve educational technologies through co-creation in user-centered real context learning environments. Uh, therefore, experimentation takes place in our physical, remote, uh, or hybrid classrooms with faculty members and students as end users and co-creators. And uh, moreover, selected proposals are assessed and mentored by International Advisory Board of Researchers and Experts. And this ensures that their successful development, their successful development and publication of outcomes as open access scientific articles. So, so far, we've hosted three research and development calls, which involve partnerships with three uh, ethics from uh, Mexico, the US, and Brazil. Two calls uh, are focused on measuring the impact that remote and virtual labs have in distance learning, while the third focuses uh, on the development of pedagogical materials to develop new, new virtual labs that will be available uh, worldwide. Uh, eight selected proposals from such calls are currently under development, and they involve 18 researchers from Te Tecnológico de Monterrey Campi, as well as external educational institutions. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we're establishing an experiential classroom at IFP, which consists uh, of the equipment of a learning space with more than 15 multimodal technologies to collect, process, and analyze auditory, visual, tactile, neuronal, emotional, and spatial traces which are present in teaching and learning interactions. And this is in order to conduct a multimodal learning analytics research, which aims to close the gap, as, as it was said before in the introduction between technology and pedag pedagogy, by translating multimodal data into learning indicators through the use of AI. Uh, we're expecting to begin uh, conducting research with different technologies in the first quarter of 2023. And we also expect that the IFE experiential classroom will be fully operational by 2024. 
Uh, this space will open its doors to multi-institutional research groups, which are interested in educational innovation, but also to research and development departments in companies looking to study specific products and services, and as well to technology companies who, uh, which are willing to include their devices and be tested and evaluated on site. Uh, we hope that the, the establishment of this experiential classroom will foster collaborations with experts from different disciplines around the world, uh, and as well as impact uh, millions of students and contribute to the future of education. Uh, finally, I'd like to mention that uh, the IFE recently signed an alliance with the Singapore University of Technology and Design, which uh, Kenneth Law is representing in this, in this panel. And uh, it aims to enhance the areas of opportunity in the application of human-centric technology and design for the practice of pedagogy in, in cyber physical learning environments. So we believe this project will allow the evaluation of educational aspects, such as the design of learning experiences, enable to technology, uh, transnational pedagogical innovation, learning analytics, and personalized learning. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, well, uh, I already have some questions that uh, would like to ask to our speakers. And I will invite as well to, to the audience to send their questions through, through the Q&A uh, option of your Zoom uh, or through the WoW application, okay? Uh, let's begin with uh, the first, que first question. Which are the benefits from introducing and applying AI for teaching and learning in the classroom? Uh, Genaro, which is your perspectives on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can hear me. Um, the benefits for introducing and applying artificial intelligence. Uh, well, you know, there are many routine tasks that instructors have, such as marking assignments or in general assessments that impart uh, many of the things that in assessment are doing, not everything, but many of the things that we do in assessments, uh, it is possible to automate. So that's something that is very uh, beneficial for instructors because then the remaining time that is, is gaining is for focusing on, on, on the process of teaching and learning. Also, um, well, there are a lot of experiences in technology Monterey and has a lot of experience in virtual teaching assistants that can answer many questions of uh, students that are frequently asked. Uh, then another one, it could be apply adaptive learning like we are doing it to improve learning. Uh, the, the, the first project that we talked about, well, the, everybody was talking about those kind of projects. And to analyze the students' abilities, interests, and potential uh, with tools such as the ones we are working on iClassroom, the one that uh, Roberto is, is, is using, the one that Luis talked about, and the one that we are gonna use for the project between Tecnológico Monterrey and the, univer the, the San University of uh, Singapore Technology. <laughs> yeah. Those are the, the things that I think that it should be very beneficial. Okay. Uh, uh, Kenneth, Roberto? Mm, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think uh, SUTD, we see AI as a potential tool that can actually hopefully uh, offer, I think the main concept is personalized learning because uh, we understand that each student learns differently. I mean, you know, the way they understand information is different. So their learning journeys uh, will be quite unique for each student. And of course, right now, the way we teach is, um, I, mean, I guess, the, the, the usual traditional way. And it's kind of hard to, um, you know, tweak your content to each and every student. But with AI, we see potential that, you know, through the learning journeys of students, for example, simply like, you know, uh, some quizzes, they perform extra well. Then maybe the AI can recommend more uh, higher order kind of content to them to push their learning, for example. Or if a student has um, not performing well in certain uh, quizzes, scores throughout their uh, uh, learning journey, 
the content can then adjust something to help them. And of course, with AI, you know, um, it can also alert the tutor as well, the lecturers to come in. So we hope to see AI, uh, you know, to offer benefits in terms of personalization and also for, uh, in terms of introduction of, uh, you know, early interventions to help students to improve. So these are some of the uh, benefits that we hope uh, AI would do. Uh, of course, right now uh, at SLTD, we are uh, using AI more at the uh, right now to, as part of learning analytics, to gauge, for example, the level of engagement with students. So we are tracking some of their facial expressions. Uh, you know, we also have an engine to convert text to uh, speech to text to see that, you know, um, the discussions that they are holding is in the right context of the, of the topic that we are studying. So we are trying to use AI at this, uh, currently at this level, but uh, we do see potential uh, to improve learning and most importantly, to enable early interventions to come in so that we can help students, you know, who really need the help. And yeah, and the whole thing is really to generate a positive learning experience for students. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. There's an engagement uh, and intervention seems to be uh, two difficult things to to tackle. Uh, mm. And here comes the question about the challenges. Okay, so uh, introducing all these technologies and all these uh, tools, uh, mm. which are the challenges that, that, that poses for institutions to the researchers? And Roberto, could you help us with, with some thoughts in that direction? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I'm going to try to just briefly um, connect with benefits or well, expected benefits of AI. Um, it's very contextual, right? Uh, the benefits and the challenges of AI will, will depend on how we are uh, trying to use AI, what is the intention of it. But at the same time, AI is a moving target. We cannot say that is, um, well, we know that what AI is and what are the capabilities today um, in the next uh, year are gonna be completely different. And the time span of changes is going to be just reducing, reducing because we are seeing new technologies that are just disrupting all our preconceptions. Um, I'm just gonna name one, G uh, GPT-3. Um, probably you, you're starting to hear here and there how it's technology that, that they can answer you with new content to any of the questions that you pose and that can create from scratch text that reads well, that reads like passable. And it doesn't need to be even perfect um, because in, in education, we, we know that learners are developing skills. And this technology, for example, could be used by uh, the students to, to submit that work. And, and we are not going to be able to to identify actually if it reads bad we're gonna think oh maybe this thing can can improve and this is just something that happened this year actually in the last uh, weeks um we are seeing changes in algorithms changes in what ai can can do uh, are, are, are gonna just be speeding up and i feel that that's the main challenge education does not necessarily change that quickly actually from our experience we we know that it takes time to even change of course, so now imagine about the whole system being disrupted by these new technologies. And, um, and if I can share something very quickly, um, this was uh, something that was tweeted by one of my students. It was a, res a response from, uh, GP uh, from OpenAI on GPT-3 GPT when someone asked about, okay, how are we going mm -hmm. to avoid that the students are gonna cheat in, in assignments by using this? And, OpenAI responds, I mean, it's just OpenAI, it's just a company. What they're talking about, yeah, you can use plagiarism detection software. No, that's not going to detect um, this, this text because it's new. It's actually novel. And um, what they really recommended, I think that's going to be a decision to consider is um, to educate the students about academic integrity. That's important. But also thinking about how to create assessments that are proof 
against these new developments. The problem is that a new development is going to come and potentially disrupt that new learning design. And, and I feel that's potentially the main challenge of, of using AI beyond our best intentions of, you know, the projects that we talk about that are like, yeah, let's, let's augment the learning environment. The problem is that AI is not only gonna come from our good intentions, it's just gonna come in different ways. And, and it's gonna be accessible to students in different ways, not necessarily within a framework of, um, uh, of a pedagogical intention, a pedagogical uh, course. Um, we can, we're not gonna be able to say, okay, you cannot use AI for, for, salt, for writing your code or for writing your essay. And, and that's gonna be a, a challenge, but at the same time, it's gonna be exciting because it's just new tools that are going to be emerging and mm -hmm. potentially, uh, our ancestors were also a little bit scared when television came and also radio and then internet and, oh, and, and video and, and they were the same kind of fears. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that there was no challenge in that process of adoption. Thank you, Roberto. Interesting points of view. Uh, Fernando, Luis Fernando. Yeah, uh, I would like to complement something that Roberto was talking about. And it is that uh, sometimes there are developments in AI, like AI algorithms or techniques, which are applied to specific projects in specific uh, groups or classrooms in specific institutions. They are, they are tailored for such a project. And when someone, someone else is trying to reproduce or utilize that such AI algorithms, it could be prove pro difficult to be to be deployed in in a different setting. So uh, I think that a challenge would be uh, to be to work towards uh, more compatible, standardized, and easy to deploy uh, AI algorithms, uh, so that uh, learning data processing and analysis uh, is easier. I mean, and it's compatible between different settings, different institutions, different classrooms. And that is because many institutions already have educational technologies as tools that facilitate the teaching and learning process, but they lack, sometimes they lack the resources or skills to effectively process and analyze such data that is collect, uh, collected in those interactions. So uh, other, than, other than having like uh, different versions and instances of the same kind of analysis and processing techniques on different projects and institutions, it would be interesting to, to, work, to jointly work to develop uh, procedures that could be applied, for example, in e each of our institutions, uh, given that we have different uh, types of classrooms, uh, either they're physical or digital or cy cyber physical or uh, hybrid, I don't know. Uh, that would be one of the challenges. Uh, I think another challenge, which is also important to take into account is that uh, using some of these uh, devices, uh, so it's, sometimes it's difficult only starting to afford to afford them because they are they are costly. So ma many high quality educational technologies that take advantage of AI, uh, they they're not low cost, and they and therefore institutional uh, institutions need to seek for additional resources only to start uh, getting into this into this kind of projects. So uh, in this sense, I, I think a, a recommendation would be uh, to apply jointly uh, with other educational institutions uh, to foundation grants, for example. And because that, in that sense, uh, several institutions can integrate a robust project with consolidated researchers, and that maybe can result in successful applications of, of educational technology with AI, but in institutions that otherwise wouldn't not be able to afford such technologies. Hector, can I have a word for the challenges? I think I, I have a, I agree with, with Roberto and Luis. But I, I have a, a, another type of challenges that we should address in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. One of them is, is um, inclusion and equity. So the intense use of artificial intelligence in, in education can create ga uh, digital gaps, greater digital gaps for developed, between, between developed and underdeveloped countries, but also between rich and poor students in the same country. So this is a challenge that, that we have to create policies and projects that pursue equity and inclusion. That's very important for me. And the other one is mm -hmm. ethics and transparency in, that, in data collection and, and its use. 
because artificial intelligence has many applications, that's true, but it could have very uh, deep ethical concerns for society. So one of them is inclusion, for instance, as one ethical, ethical problem but also uh, the personal data that, that the, the, the systems are uh, acquiring uh, and the privacy of that data, it is important. So those are two challenges that are broader. And one of them that is very close to what I do is the cognitive learning. There are many applications of artificial intelligence that uh, uh, help students to learn processes, to use algorithms, that's true have improved that, that it helps to that for that. However, not many results indicate that uh, uh, adaptive learning, for instance, can improve conceptual learning. So this is a very specific challenge that we have to address. Um, just to add to uh, what Gennaro is talking about on the ethical uh, perspectives, um, the experience at SUTD, um, we also have feedback from students that um, they were concerned about how some of these uh, data being captured for AI processing uh, will be handled. Yeah, so for example, we had a motion sensor and uh, you know, and it has to be anonymous. We can't, cap we can't save the images of the face. So we have to add uh, additional processing to convert to skeleton structure and just store that skeleton structure without any identifiers. And we also got feedback from students uh, in regards to all these AI tools is whether some of the data that pertains to them, would it be shared to other lecturers outside of this course? Because they have a concern that, I guess in a way, you know, that if their performance in one course is, you know, good, bad, you know, at whatever level would affect, you know, the perception of lecturers from other causes, which I think is a very valid concern because it's back to this ethical consideration. Does it, you know, will it have some preconceived ideas that when lecturers from other causes see some data from this course? So there's this also the comfort level of uh, students towards, you know, how their data is being captured and how this data, you know, is being shared even among within the same university diff among different causes. Yeah. The ethical issues are a real concern uh, everywhere. Uh, so, uh, and also depending on the country, you have different different uh, regulations and different things to to think about when you launch a joint project, for instance, uh, one of the recommendations we hear. Uh, yes, now, uh, in particular, when we are talking about a, a physical, physical space or a hybrid space, cyber, cyber physical space, uh, how, how you imagine that, uh, how you are working on that uh, to get, to enable this space, uh, these different spaces and, and learn from, from it and improve the, the learning in, in those environments. Uh, Roberto just may, uh, show the, the scenario of a health healthcare uh, where it's, it's clear that it's a very specific, very specific uh, task they are doing and the information they are getting is very, very important. Uh, is there any other scenario where you are working uh, in this sense, uh, Roberto? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question, Hector. Yeah, we also have um, another scenario where we're helping teachers to look at their spatial pedagogy behaviors. Spatial pedagogy um, is a um, very niche as well, uh, theoretical perspective, but it's about how the meaning of space changes depending on the actions that the teachers are doing. And something that is happening, um, at least here in Australia, is um, that team teaching is becoming a, a major thing. Uh, compared to my home country, uh, Mexico, um, the teaching uh, is, is very different because here we have like lots of students in classrooms sometimes, uh, hundreds <laughs> sometimes. So if they need um, 
more than one teacher left and and just adding an extra teacher just changes the dynamics of of the physicality of the space is is like now what well, what are the strategies that the teachers are going to follow they need to coordinate if there's three it becomes even more complex so um it, it, all the the problems and the challenges in education are very contextualized. Um, some are, are similar to others, but we are trying to um, support, especially higher education teachers, uh, which sometimes don't have, or, or the most common uh, situation is that they don't have a, an actual training in using the classroom space. And this is a very interesting opportunity in using sensors, which I totally agree with this as complex and expensive sometimes to, to set up. and. And, and we're facing that in, in some of the learning spaces where, where we are working, um, where the technology is starting to get there to augment that space and support um, uh, the reflection of, of about the physicality of the space, but at the same time, um, the, the next challenge is how can we give meaning to those low level traces that come from the sensors, like in this case, positioning data from teachers, um, sometimes we can estimate also the angle of the bodies so we can know if they're facing to a whiteboard or, or they're facing to the students. And we also augment the microphone. So we started to, to recreate this space with the purpose of um, supporting professional development. And I totally agree with Genaro that uh, in this, even in this situation I'm describing, the problem is that, okay, what are the uses of this data? Some, some uh, potential institutional uses could be to, to also get this information to, um, to rate the teacher, you know, how well is it, is it doing in the classroom? But the ethical question is, uh, is this data enough? Uh, is, is that even uh, appropriate? Um, can be measured just on, on physical uh, traces? So, uh, I think the, the use of the data um, is a political issue um, uh, at all levels. And, and this is another scenario that opens up all these other additional discussion because now we're talking about teachers and supporting them in their team activity in the physical classroom versus students and the relationships of power and their voices are considered institutionally sometimes differently. So it's very interesting a space that brings additional challenge and, and things to reflect on. Um, and if we do it as research projects, it's, it's protected under an ethical protocol. And, and we also have very good intention. We use the practices from human-centered design. But what will happen when we start seeing these products just being available? And how are we going to know who is accountable for the uses of this data? And, 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 and that's why we need collaboration. As, as Liz also mentioned, I'm, I'm excited to, to learn more about the Living Lab, like collaboration with edtech and, and acad academia is important to keep that conversation and keep all the parties in check of, okay, where are we going as a society in, in using AI in the classroom, especially in physical spaces where sensors sometimes can capture even more things that are not related to learning. Um, and if we start also with physiological sensors, we open up different conversations about, okay, we're starting to also obtain models um, of people, of things that happen under the skin. And, and that's something that even with video, we, we cannot easily see. And we're just gonna get more information about people. And if this data ends up in, 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 in other hands, it could be even commercialized. And, um, and we, we know that, that we shouldn't do that, but it could happen in, in the future, in a dystopian future, and potentially it has happened um, in, some, in some situations. So, so there are several challenges at different levels, and, and I guess every, every a new application of AI in, in education can make some of these challenges more visible, less visible. Thanks. Thanks, Helen Roberto. Uh, Luis, how, how do you see this, these spaces, the, the necessity of, you talk about uh, having a hybrid environment. How, what challenges do, do you see in that? Uh, well, for example, some of the challenges 
I mean, they could start just by uh, considering that uh, you would be connecting two different educational institutions with, which are in different countries. They probably have different languages and they probably have different pe uh, pedagogic designs or uh, learning designs. So, uh, I mean, first of all, you need to uh, see how you're going to connect both, uh, both the students on, on each side. And how are they going to interact? Because I mean, it's it, if, we, if we're thinking about an interactive space, it, it wouldn't be just uh, collaborating like in a, in a video conference as we're doing right now. But uh, both students would have to uh, be able to uh, perform tasks which are hands-on, but which some but, but that somehow are connected connected between both institutions. I mean, there should be they could be using perhaps a virtual scenario where both students are collaborating on performing a task, or uh, perhaps a student on one side is performing a task uh, that actually controls something remotely on the second institution. And then uh, they would see like uh, an interaction, like an, an automatic uh, synchronous interaction that could take place uh, on both ends. Uh, these are, I mean, these, these present different uh, types of challenges right, related to uh, communication, uh, connection, time zones is also an important difficulty that has to be taken into account. And the platforms and the devices that are that would be required to, to be able to establish this connection. And then moreover, uh, I was just talking about two students and one on each side. So now what happens if we would be, if we would have like five or 10 students on each side of the, of the world trying to connect and collaborate at the same time. So uh, we may have uh, technologies which could could already be applied for that scenario, but they they will still require uh, complements and and processes and and developments of of modules that that would be specific for that type of project. Uh, I think that that's one of the of the great difficulties. But that would I mean, the availability of such a space would uh, definitely uh, benefit in the in the sense that it would allow students to access. For example, high quality education from anywhere in the world. And I mean, this, this would be, would allow them to acquire, for example, specialized competencies from world class institutions, uh, which are on, the, on, on another place in the world and becoming key actors and professionals in their place of residence without be, being able to move. Because I mean, I don't know, like 10, 20 years ago, if you, if you wanted to have to perform studies, or postgraduate studies in a, in a top institution, you would have to travel and uh, perform your studies on another country. And maybe in the future with this kind of tools and, and platforms, we would be able to gain, acquire this knowledge without having to, to change residence. And that would make uh, education more convenient and affordable for many people. Thank you, excellent. Uh, Kenneth, what about cyber-physical? learning oh, thank you yeah you asked a very interesting question because um i think um at, you know over sctd uh you know we went through this uh, period of the uh, covid pandemic and at that time there were a lot of challenges because um you know students were you know we had this hybrid hybrid classes where some were coming face to face some were actually online and we found that it was quite difficult to give the same learning experience, especially to the remote, we call it cyber students. And that was one of the drivers that actually uh, led us to think about how can we teach in a cyber physical space, like what Lewis was mentioning, you know, how can remote students, cyber students interact just as well as though they are in class, you know, at the same level as face-to-face -face students with the lecturer, with the teaching instructor. So we came up with some ideas. I, I mean, we had one trial uh, that was talk, looking at telepresence robot, where students uh, choose this, uh, um, some of the controls on a robotics can signal that they have a question. They can have a laser pointer to point at some objects because in SUTD, we have a lot of team-based learning and also a lot of hands-on learning. So that was one of the, um, the, uh, the, the drivers. But in setting up all this uh, cyber physical learning, technology is important because uh, 
you know, how do we enable all these interactions? And of course, the lecturer to interact effect effectively and equitable, equitably with both types of students, cyber students and remote students. So this is one important aspect. The other important aspect we realize is also, actually there are two other important aspects. The other important aspect is also the pedagogy because how students react and how we teach in a cyber physical world can be, I think will be quite different to how we teach in a physical, physical world. So that is also something we have to look into to understand deeper, you know, what are the best practices out there. And that's why I'm happy to say that this, uh, we also have a collaboration with uh, tech you know, to uh, understand this deeper as well in this uh, pedagogical space. And the other dimension is also the ethical space because right now we have uh, students who are in the cyber world and in the physical world. And because they are interacting together, you know, are there some things that is uh, not some behaviors or some interaction that are not desirable? You know, for example, students could uh, make fun of robots behind the backs of the cameras. So, you know, is that something that we want to allow or is that something that we do not want to allow? So there's this sort of ethical behavior that we also have to look into, you know, because in the real world, we have our social norms. We have, of course, the, the law and regulations that generate these social norms. But in the cyber physical world, are there uh, new social norms or new uh, ways of behavior that we should encourage? And the other concept is also, uh, you know, right now we are talking about cyber physical learning. We also have the traditional physical, physical learning, but there's also the cyber, cyber learning. For example, metaverse learning, people are talking about it. So in, in that space, it's the same, you know, we also have the technological issues, the pedagogical challenges, and in this case, the uh, ethical challenges as well. We also, I'm sure everyone has heard of some uh, incidents that happen in a metaverse kind of world. So, you know, we have to be careful how students interact in that space. You know, what gets said or what gets done. You know, are those, no one can be physically hurt in that kind of a cyber, cyber learning environment, but that could be, you know, a mental trauma from some of these negative interactions. So these are some of the, the challenges and, but, we do see overall that there is great potential. I think like what Lewis was mentioned, once we have a system that can give various options, learning pathways for students to learn, you know, you know, it can make education more accessible and more equitable. For example, you know, uh, people in other countries can study in a more expensive country without having to incur great costs to go there. So education is more accessible. And for example, people with certain uh, disabilities, you know, in terms of mobility, they cannot travel to a, move to a, to a tertiary university, but through some of these technology platforms, they can assess education. So we see great potential, you know, in terms of uh, equitability, in terms of accessibility. You know, when we look at these options for cyber physical and of course, uh, cyber cyber kind of learning thank you thank you Kenneth and, and you mentioned something very important that Genera mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, could tell us about the pedagogical design mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I just will make an analogy with smart cities in smart cities uh, engineers rapidly install sensors in the roads mm -hmm. and the buildings and once they have all the information, they ask themselves, what could I do with that data? <laughs> but, uh, but in this case, we're talking about uh, students. Uh, so it's not mm -hmm. as easy as uh, putting all the sensors and then see what happens. Uh, Genaro, mm -hmm. how about radical design? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in that? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, first, first of all, Kenneth, uh, to all my words. <laughs> so what Kenneth said, I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that, I mean, we have learned a lot because of the pandemics. We, we have learned a lot before the pandemics. 
that's that's something we should say. But the pandemics accelerated everything, and in this case, accelerated the teaching of cyberspace. Um, but you know, the point is, how many times in a century we have a pandemic? Well, we have been one once in a, in one hundred years. So hopefully, we are not going to have another pandemic until. Uh, 2,100 something, right? And any of us will be there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, then we should ask ourselves, it's not that we want to be prepared for a pandemic. Probably people will think in, a future, in the future in that way, but I, I would like to think about the, the way we are and the time we are now. And the time we are now, the pandemic is dying and we have to see what the pandemics left us to learn. And I think that it is very important not to take aside that students have many levels of learning, many uh, levels, and one of them is cyberspace, cyber uh, physical and, and cyber combined, but also they learn individually. So uh, artificial intelligence has to do a lot on that. They have to know, they have to um, uh, learn how to learn individually with adaptive learning, for instance. So that's one level we have to work on very, very intensely. The other is we know nowadays, and, and Kenneth said that, we know that students interact better when they are in a physical environment and they interact with each other better like Roberto showed the pictures, I mean, they are interacting physically with, you know, with a, a laboratory, but it's still, they are interacting. And this is the best way to learn. I, the data show us, right? And when the pandemics came along, we had a lot of trouble because we wanted to change whatever we were doing in physical environments to cyber environments, and we were not very good, right? But we, we did many things that we learned that probably are going to be good in the future. So we have to pay attention, focus on physical environments to increase learning there, use artificial intelligence like sensors and everything to improve learning in physical environments because that's the best way. Now, that comes along with um, the cyber physical environment. And that's something we are working right now with is UTD, in which we want to see what we learn in the pandemics and put it together with a pedagogical framework to improve learning in that space. And probably, I mean, it could be, but probably we are not going to be as good as the physical environment, but it could be very good. So that's something we should work on and artificial intelligence will, will help a lot. So that's my thinking. I mean, we, we have to pay attention, of course, in cyber physical, we, but we have to pay attention in individual learning with tools and we have to pay attention in physical environments. And in every level, artificial intelligence is, pay, is playing a big role. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, very yeah, right. Uh, I think we have only six minutes left, so I will. Uh, uh, we won't have much time for answering the questions in, in in the in the platform. We already talk about the ethical issues, but uh, there's something about K twelve classrooms. Uh, if you have any thought about it, uh, and we could close with uh, with your final thoughts. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Roberto. Let's we'll start with Roberto. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, talking about again about physical space, and I love um, the Genaro reflection about the importance of the physicality. That's what I've been uh, keeping uh, even do, uh, after during COVID, thinking, oh, maybe now education is going to move online. Um, there's then, then we stick into the, the physicality and augmenting the physical environments. And I really started to like this idea of cyber physical uh, learning environments. And um, talking about K-12 
um, education, we, well, some colleagues in, in our university run very interesting study, um, which was putting a, a positioning sensor on each kid in a school and seeing how things happen. That was uh, lots of data. Another challenge is how to get to, to make, give meaning to it. And um, it was very exciting to see and the possibilities of just this very raw X and Y positioning data um, enabling identifying, uh, for example, behaviors such as um, kids being um, isolate, or isolating themselves after certain periods. And we started to see, oh, maybe there's potential in using this data um, for um, doing something to help that kid, you know, to give some support or identify sometimes just as teachers, they don't have, we cannot follow all these, these things, hard to see. Um, but at the same time, we were thinking, um, we don't want kids to live like that. You know, we don't want kids as well to live with a sensor to, in the being tracked because you can enable good things, but <laughs> it can also open up um, excessive surveillance. So um, we're talking with kids is just as well just being mindful about what that, that what we are trying to do is to support to support children. And if we are going to introduce um, a lot of, uh, especially from an AI perspective, we need data. So we need to capture that data somehow. So creating the framework, the ethical framework and actually the policy around using that data is critical. So we don't miss the point and we start to track kids uh, activities from early age and and sometimes we want to then use that data throughout the 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 whole lives and start to get into this potential dystopian scenario of over tracking and over surveillance so just we're talking with kids just just as a final message for myself would be um and potential also for adults um always focusing on the utility and 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 the good for for the students and also we need to pay attention on all the potential scenarios we cannot um if then say oh we, we didn't expect that potential use uh, for ai and for capturing data that's really critical to think about overthink potentially a little bit about all the potential uses because as we learn from from our studies these simple x and y data can tell a lot about someone Imagine we start adding an extra layer of data that is more personal and more meaningful. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, Luis, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that what uh, Roberto is mentioning is very interesting because uh, many of these uh, AI applications in the classroom uh, usually require devices and sensors that sometimes can be intrusive to the students involved in the learning process. So. First of all, they have to get accustomed to be using these devices before you can even start performing a study. Because otherwise, for example, if it's a camera, maybe the student will act differently uh, considering that he's being recorded, right? But uh, until uh, he or she is ready and already accustomed to the setting, maybe then they'll forget about having a camera. So in the future, uh, the development of ubiquitous devices and services would greatly improve. Uh, the learning experience and outcomes of these kinds of projects. Um, I mean, th this this will come in time, not not maybe not in the near future. We will be working towards that, but it also comes with the uh, challenge and difficulty of how is this uh, this ubiquitous sensor is going to be used to avoid having, uh, as Roberto mentioned, over surveillance or privacy issues or uh, other kinds of, uh, of problems, right? So that, that, I mean, that's that's how I uh, how I see the, the future in this in these kinds of settings. But I also believe that uh, the availability of, of these technologies will also allow, as Kenneth uh, said before, the students to access high quality education from any place in the world. And this and that will be a, a great thing uh, for disadvantaged communities. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Kenneth, final thoughts? Yeah, I think. Like what the previous speakers were saying, uh, you know, this comfort with technology is important. Um, but I also recommend, you know, suggest that, you know, the uh, because they are K twelve and it's quite a broad range, and and uh, to engage these students um, to explain why you know AI is being used, why their data is being captured. 
because it's because at that age range they, there could be some concerns and i think it's along with that it's also very important to engage their parents as well because uh, you know with ai you can capture a lot of uh, data and uh, people who want to know especially parents you know we are all parents how the children's data is being used um, you know at such an early age um, so there are i think additional considerations and i i would suggest that uh, you know the comfort level of students the comfort level of their parents would be uh, something that we have to consider uh, as well as the technological uh, challenges implications as well thank you ken hello yeah um i would like to add that um i would love to have k-12 students for the i classroom project because students in that other age I, I, I agree with kenneth that it is a long range but but the students in early ages they express emotion freely and that's very important for them to learn <laughs> <laughs> And then we hire education students. They, you know, they they hire emotions, and they they are not as as good as good in that sense with K to twelve students. So that's I think for our project will be very good to have K to twelve students. We don't have them, and we are not going to work with them. But we would love to work with them. The other point that Kennedy is saying is very important. Students, they they I mean, it is not necessary that they agree to get. To get uh, to to be there uh, for the researcher to get data because they are underage. So the one the one that we had convinced is the parents. If the parents agree, that's it. That what we'll, all the researchers need the parents approval of the taking the data. Now for a project, for instance, if we are if we have cameras, many many schools in the U.S. and in Mexico that I know of have cameras right now because they are pro they are broadcasting the classroom because of security things. I mean, the parents can just go online and see their children working in the classroom. So the, the idea there is to convince uh, parents that, that those images are, will be analyzed to improve learning. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much to everyone. Very interesting discussion. I hope the, the audience have enjoyed the, the, the talk and had some insights, many, many concepts that could be applied, uh, many research lines that could be traced from here, uh, that you already are developing. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, with this, we conclude the panel. Have a nice day, morning, night. <laughs> See you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Bye. having a chat with you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.